I'm Pat Matthews, Associate Dean in University College. Welcome to the third talk in our MLA lecture series. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are on traditional homelands of Native people. We pay respect to elders, both past and present, and we thank them for their hospitality. The Master of Liberal Arts program addresses a broad range of cultural issues from different academic perspectives. Similarly, the MLA lecture series addresses a unique theme each year from multiple disciplines in hopes that hearing from diverse points of view provides insights and promotes discussion beyond the sum of the individual talks. Our theme this year is transition. We heard from Jonathan Lassos about transitions occurring in the natural world and the efforts of the Living Earth Collaborative to reduce the loss of diversity of species. Last week, Tim Portlock shared his luminous digital images of urban environments that are both inspired by American landscape painters and challenge American values. Each of these transitions was brought on by a crisis, loss of species and degradation of urban environments. Today's talk also addresses a transition brought on by a crisis, a crisis in the field of humanities. It's my honor to introduce today's speaker, Stephanie Kirk is professor of Spanish and affiliate professor of religious studies and women, gender, and sexuality studies. She's been at WashU since 2003 after receiving her PhD from New York University. She's the author of two books, Sor Juana Inez de la Cruz and the Gender Politics of Knowledge in Colonial Mexico, and Convent Life in Colonial Mexico, A Tale of Two Communities and the editor of a third book, Religious Transformations in Early Modern America. She, I'm sorry, Early out Modern Americas. <laughs> Difference. Very important. Yes. She also serves as editor of the Revista de Estudios Hispanicos. Professor Kirk also directs the Doctor of Liberal Arts and Master of Liberal Arts programs in University College. Professor Kirk's decades of work researching, teaching, organizing conferences and panels across multiple humanities disciplines, as well as her direction of graduate programs focused on the humanities, put her in an ideal place to reflect on the humanities as a whole. She has done just that as a member of multiple national committees for the Modern Languages Association, where she's worked with scholars across the country to address the crisis in her discipline. Her talk is entitled, Humanities in Transition, Challenges and Opportunities. Stephanie Kirk. Uh, thank you, Pat, very, very much for that very kind introduction. And thank you to everybody for coming out this morning. Uh, yes, I am afraid that I, too, am going to use the C word, the crisis word. Um, although I'm going to try and give this question of crisis a little bit of nuance. Um, and so I want to talk today about possible transitions for the humanities. This, I realize, is somewhat unusual, the idea of transition, because so many headlines point to the question of crisis. Headlines over the last couple of years read, um, for example, as follows. There is no case for the humanities. Can the crisis in the humanities be solved? Are the humanities in crisis? How can we save them? The slow death of the humanities. And are the humanities history, to name just a very few. And then there's a lot more. There's a lot of articles as well that talk about, don't call this a crisis, say something else. So we are inundated with images of crisis in the humanities. While the discussion about the turn away from the humanities, the crisis, the value of a humanities degree, or the de-emphasizing of humanities subjects in K-12 through has been going on for decades, I think, the reality of a true crisis began to set in with the financial crisis, the financial crash of 2008. One of the most tangible ways that we measure um, the relative strength of a branch of study in the university itself is through numbers of undergraduate majors. And the Department of Education shows a steady decline in these numbers from 2008. Across a variety of institutions, from elite to community college, uh, the number of majors has dropped. And even though the economy recovered during the Obama years, these figures did not. The big four humanities fields, philosophy, history, language, languages, and English are at risk of dipping below 100,000 degrees for the first time in almost 20 years. 
almost every humanities field has seen a rapid drop in majors. History is down about 45% from its two, two I think, yeah, history is not important anymore, <laughs> from its 2007 peak, while the number of English majors has fallen by nearly half since the late 1990s, and declines have hit almost every field. Meanwhile, language departments like my own, with very different traditions, so Spanish has a very different national tradition from French, from German, from Chinese, obviously. These are often being consolidated into departments of modern language, departments of foreign language, or disbanded altogether. Foreign language is also not necessary for today's students. Perhaps one of the most telling indicators of humanity's decline comes when we look at the figures from elite universities such as our own. Our, our students have traditionally, some of them, been somewhat insulated from the need to make their degree work for them. The number of students majoring in humanities subjects at WashU has, was has fallen radically. So let me quickly show this. Um, Okay. Oh. Okay, here we go. So um, this is, I know, not an ideal slide, so I'll talk you through a few of the, of the main numbers. But we can see the drop in majors beginning uh, in 2010 at around 710 for humanities. Then it took a radical dip in 2017 to 500. And now we've, <laughs> we're, we're celebrating the rise to 564 of humanities majors. So you can see that um, we really have gone. And these numbers, because you know, 700 is not a huge number, um, to lose, to go down to 500 or go down to 564 is really quite high. And then we had also traditionally counted on having, oh, well, if you're not going to do a Spanish major, perhaps you'll be a bio major. You can be a Spanish minor. But minors have also uh, taken a bit of a hit, although they've gone up. And so I guess what we're seeing now is that we still want to do Spanish, but we'll do it as a minor. We can't really afford, in many different ways, to major. Um, so, hang on. There we go. So I just wanted to give you a kind of sort of on the ground, wash you look at what's going on. The number of students majoring then has fallen, and this is we can see this across both men and women, different types of institution, racial groups, ethnic groups, and in a, just in a variety of places across the country. 20, 2008's financial crisis and the Great Recession drove students away from majors in the humanities and towards STEM subjects, even at liberal arts colleges that had never really put science first. Key to this is the issue of finding a job post-college and finding a job that allows students to support themselves while paying off hefty financial loans, crippling student loans. In the past decade, students have identified finding a job as the number one reason to go to college. Um, 20 years ago, the number one reason for going to college was learning new things. So we can see the massive change in kind of perspective now. Rising college costs and the fact that these students' earliest memories might be of a parent or a friend, of the family losing a job, losing a house, has really changed students' desires about what they want to do when they enter college. The perception exists that the humanities cannot get you a well-paying job. So one common explanation does line up with the data fairly well, at least in part that students fled the humanities after the financial crisis because they were fearful. The fields that have risen in the past decade are STEM majors, nursing, engineering, computer science, biology. Quantitative social sciences like the economics and psychology of health study while fields in closer proximity to the humanities, sort of social science in, or humanities inflected social sciences like political science, sociology, anthropology, have also seen declines. There is an important caveat here, and it has to do with the word that I mentioned earlier, perception. Data suggests that actually psychology is one of the majors, one of the things that students who major in psychology come out earning less than any other degree, right? Um, humanities majors are actually not making much less than others and are less likely to be unemployed than social science or natural science majors, life science majors. More significant actually than what you study is who you are. Women, shockingly, are still making less than men in any other field, right? 
Um, oh, sorry. Yes, that's true. And more significant question of gender with men humanities majors making less, making more than women in any other field except engineering. Um, and I, so the question of perception is really important here. And uh, uh, this guy, Benjamin Schmidt, who's a professor of history at Northeastern University, and he's thought quite a lot about this. And he says, and I quote, being the type of person inclined to view a college major in terms of return on investment will probably make a much bigger difference in your earnings than the actual major does, end quote. Perception is thus erroneous and perhaps even dangerous. Some fields are becoming oversaturated. Computer science, for example. And we all know what happened to computer science majors after the dot-com crash. So while the need for degree holders in nursing is unfortunately never likely to diminish, it is harder to guarantee that for other subjects. And these perceptions have had knock-on effects for humanities disciplines, right? And the knock-on effect goes to things like PhDs, right? So fewer PhDs that we graduate from our departments, English, language, are getting jobs. Because if there are no undergrads to teach, then why would anyone want to hire a PhD student? And this has led to then what we call the adjunctification of the academy, where there are no tenure track jobs, but there are plenty of precarious jobs, semester to semester renewal. And it ends up creating a very hostile working environment in academia. And we also have to ask, and perhaps this is a bigger question, what happens to cultural inquiry and the university as a center for the development of knowledge and debate if humanities are no longer a chosen field of studies? So that is the crisis. <laughs> While these statistics are certainly alarming, depressing, panic-inducing even, and I've been in those meetings where panic has been induced, what does it mean within the confines of a discipline, English, history, foreign language, to talk about crisis? And what, if there is a crisis, what possible solutions are there? Schmidt tells us, the history professor, that we should be careful about how we contextualize the type of numbers regarding majors. While majors have dropped, students are still taking mainly lower level classes in our, in our areas, right? Um, so, Students are still willing to go to classes in history, go to classes in languages, go to classes in English. Maybe they don't want to major. Maybe their parents don't want them to major. But they will take our classes. He also thinks we need to look at interest in newer majors, majors like gender and sexuality studies, Latinx studies, ethnic studies. And these numbers are more buoyant, reflecting student interest. And I'll come back to this in a moment. So then signs point to the fact that crisis might be too strong a word. The humanities, in other words, will almost certainly survive, even if they don't return to being true peers of the social sciences and sciences in American higher education. And so to admit that the humanities are in crisis doesn't mean conceding that they are being driven extinct. It means instead, unfortunately, but less apocalyptically, that their place is diminishing, changing both them and the university as a whole. And this is important. The decisions and rhetoric around the humanities now have a special importance. Journals, libraries, universities, we ha all have to make sets of decisions around what shape the new humanities will take. And that's what I want to dedicate the rest of my talk to today. The decisions we make now will be especially important and will have continuing ramifications for what American universities and societies will look like for years to come. Right? So. I'm going to have two sort of case studies today to offer you. One is the very sort of micro look at what we're doing at WashU with our Spanish major and how we're trying to respond to some of these kind of uh, diminishments, if you will. And then the second thing I want to look at is a kind of outward look, macro look at the public humanities and how the public humanities can also be a way of bringing the humanities back into a more central discussion. Um, and then I'm going to end with a rather depressing epilogue. <laughs> but, and then there might be something at the end that makes everybody feel a tiny bit better. So we're going to go on a big roller coaster of emotions here today as we talk about the humanities. So crisis is not apt, so we should think about transition. Transition implies that we recognize a need for change but that we are not engaged in radical disruption or apocalyptic thinking, but instead we are deciding how to move forward, how to change, for change we must. And what we keep, 
and what we discard. So, as you see in the WashU statistics, the Spanish majors has suffered, but the Spanish major, the foreign language major, the history major, they've all suffered a decline in numbers, right? And this is national. For the most part, administrators, including uh, administrators at Washington University, do not value foreign language study and then do not understand the complex and multifaceted benefits offered to students. Within the humanities, foreign languages occupy the lowest place in the hierarchy. We're the low, we are the last to get resources, we have the worst offices, we have the worst building, we have the worst bathrooms. Um, what else do we have the worst of? We have the worst salaries. Um, so, and within the, the sort of like bottom of the pile foreign language, Spanish is right there at the bottom. Why is Spanish at the bottom? It's an interesting question. Spanish is, even though more people want to learn Spanish than any other foreign language in the United States, it is perceived not to be a language of high culture, whatever that is. It is perceived as a utilitarian language. As one of my students told me 10 years ago, I want to learn to speak Spanish because my dad is buying me a restaurant and I need to be able to speak to the Mexicans. As you can imagine, I did not really find that particularly heartening and then try to explain to her why she should not say that to anyone else ever again. Um, so, but at the same time, even though we know how, what our intrinsic worth is, even though we understand as faculty members what the, 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 the really urgent importance of our work, um, we have to think about explaining that to other people. Now, some faculty members do not believe that they should have to justify their existence. Why should we have to explain to people why we're so great? Well, I think we have to. And the other thing that faculty resist is why should we have to change? We have always taught like this. We have always taught these books. Why can't we continue to teach these books? But unfortunately, our students have changed. I've noticed a huge change in my students over the 16 years that I've been at Washington University. And things that I could have taught 16 years ago, I can't teach now. Students are not interested. So I think it comes back to the idea of change. We must. How do we bring students back to the major? Offer them something of value, something tangible, and something that speaks to their interests. How do we equip our students with skills and expose them to literature and culture? And how do we consider what is culture? And how do we consider what is important of literature, right? So armed with these ideas and kind of on the same page-ish, we set out to transform our major via the type of courses we teach. Make what, number one, we've decided to make what the students read more relevant for them. We have got to stop thinking about what we think is important and start thinking about what they are interested in. You can still teach the traditional text, but you have to compare them with readings that might not constitute great literature, but that speak to students' interests. Graphic novels, novels, things that deal with sexuality and gender. One, right now, two of our professors, one of them is teaching a class on podcasts and its connection, their connection to the oral storytelling tradition. And another faculty member is teaching a class on social media in Spain and political change. And students are really interested in those types of things. Link the things we study to the world around our students. Students want to discuss issues of gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, popular culture. And if this means that I, at my advanced age, have to now go out and learn more about these things, then that is fine. I am willing to do that. It is interesting. Why should I keep teaching the same things that I learned in undergraduate in the 80s? It is time to move forward. It's not a question of treating students like clients, but recognizing that the world they live in is radically different to the one in which many of our students study. Bring the local and the global to the classroom. Students want to be global citizens. They go to study abroad if they can. They learn so many things, but the local is also really interesting. They want to learn about Hispanic St. Louis. And one of my colleagues, two of my colleagues right now, are preparing a class that will help them engage more with local communities and look at the kind of Hispanic population that we have in St. Louis. Think about other ways to use language. 
my students have been saying to me for years, I can speak beautifully and eloquently, eloquently about literature, literary, literary criticism, but I can't have a conversation with a Spanish speaker unless it's about metaphors. So <laughs> let's give our students something that they need, language skills that they can really use. And there's something very popular right now called languages for the professions. Language for healthcare professions, language for uh, media professionals, language for business, translating and interpreting. Many of my colleagues think that that is absolutely unacceptable. That is not the kind of thing we do at Washington University. Well, I'm really sorry. That is the kind of thing that we need to be doing at, U at Washington University. And if we don't, somebody else is going to do it. We're going to have the business school offering their own classes. We're going to have the med school offering their own classes. We need to be the ones that offer these classes, not only because it's good for us, but it's good for our students because these classes should come from places, departments that have deep pedagogical investment in language study and not just kind of an add-on. And think about our changing demographic. When I came to Washington University in 2003, the only students that I had that had a Spanish background were very wealthy students from Puerto Rico. Now I have a huge range of students who are, uh, have Latinx backgrounds, and we need to cater to them. These, we need to be able to respond to the needs of heritage speakers, students who've grown up with Spanish in the household but don't necessarily speak or well, write it fluently. And so we're developing a curriculum for those students. So all these things allow us to be part of the conversation not only in the university, but part of the conversation in our rapidly changing world. So we must transform, adapt, and transition, not just to justify our existence, not to cater to our clients, as people say, but to be part of this conversation, as I just managed, uh, mentioned. OK, now I was going to show a couple of images, let's see, which you probably all are familiar with, but these are produced by the Modern Language Association, which is also in the business of trying to explain the importance of language and literature study. So I'll kind of scroll through and we can see. Um, we're going in the wrong direction in the United States. Verbal skills are declining. The mean SAT verbal score amongst college-bound seniors decreased more than 8%. International reading assessment, the US scores 23rd. From 1992 to 2003, the percentage of 12th graders who scored below basic on reading achievement increased from 20 to 25 percent. Those at or above proficient decreased. 45 states are spending less per student in the 25-16 school year than they did before the recession. This is not good, everybody. And look at this. In 2011, humanities research received only 48% of the amount dedicated to science and engineering. Research and development in higher education, in research and development in higher education. College libraries receive fewer than three cents of every dollar spent in higher education. And we, and I imagine this does not apply to the people who are here today, but US residents are reading less, right? Uh, <laughs> The percentage of US residents who read for pleasure declined 11%. Family members reading to children declined 8%. This probably has to do with just people's incredibly busy lives, but also to do with social media and the idea that a book is no longer something of value. But, and this is so important, and this is kind of, again, goes back to the first thing I was talking about, that employers really value these skills. Um, I have a friend who is a very important person at Wells Fargo, and he said he would, more than any other type of undergrad, would like to hire humanities undergrads. They know how to think, they know how to write, and they know how to speak. Those are the people he wants to hire. Critical thinking, communication, problem solving, right? We're going in the wrong direction. So, and the other thing I wanted to show you is this. Um, the benefits of language learning, okay? Um, biling I mean, not all of us can aim for bi being bilingual, but just learning a language at a rudimentary level is so good for us. Our life skills, cognition, this is about bilingual students, but I believe that a lot of this can be kind of sort of like 
sort of attached to just language learning in general. Longevity, no? Better recovery, healthier brain, employability, higher earnings, college success. My son is at Clayton. He's at Wydown Middle School, which is a wonderful school, but the language teaching is not strong there. It's disappointing. It's not a focus. And it really should be. And this is happening not just in the United States, but in the UK where I grew up and where I started to learn French at five. That doesn't happen anymore. So, crisis, but <laughs> solutions, as I hope to have said. I should have probably put this first because it's depressing. Okay, so, although my second sort of outward looking case study, although it is hard for academics to understand, there is life beyond the university and rich opportunities for the humanities beyond the campus. Which brings me to the second transition, thinking seriously about the public humanities, transitioning our ideas into the public sphere. One of the most useful transitions into making a case for the humanities is strengthening and developing what is known as public humanities. Don't get me wrong, public humanities have been around for a long time. We're not inventing anything now. But there is an urgency, again, to getting the message out there. Not just to bring our academic brilliance and our fantastically abstruse ideas out of the ivory tower or bestow our expertise on mere mortals, but to make our case and to partner with the public. That's what we need to do, to collaborate with people who can help us, no? Um, let's see, what are the public humanities? Well, today's event is a perfect example of the public humanities. Public humanities are the work of engaging diverse publics and reflecting on heritage, traditions, and history, and the re relevance of the humanities to the current conditions of civic and cultural life. At the center of the Public Humanities Project is a paradox. The paradox of how public humanities, which hopes to be collaborative, democratizing, and decentering, can exist within a university, which by design garners clout through a culture of exclusivity. Well, there's the problem. We need to lose the culture of exclusivity. And while this is true, and while some elements of universities still cling on to the idea that the Western canon and white privilege needs to be protected at all costs, this is finally and thankfully gradually being replaced with the idea that universities can be a major space where opportunity can be recast and reconceptualized. I just want to give you all a few examples, concrete of examples of some of the, what I think are the best public humanities programs around the country. Um, Pittsburgh University has a public humanities fellow program which creates positions in local institutions designed to take advantage of humanities, grad students, discipline specific knowledge and their skills as creative thinkers, researchers and writers. And so they create these kind of internships for 12 weeks and they send these graduate students off um, who work at places, uh, university, um, museums, community centers, cultural centers, and have done some really amazing work. Um, one of the no other places that I really admire is the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage at Brown University, which offers an MA program as well as outward-facing programming that is committed to a public humanities practice that works for social justice and explores the intersectionality of race, class, gender, and sexuality through collaborative local, national, and also international projects. And they've done conferences, exhibitions, um, digital media projects, and they real, their goal is to help us understand public history um, and cultural heritage and really help partner with the community to preserve these things. So I kind of thought, okay, well, these institutions are interesting, but who are some of the people? What are some of the stories of the people who are doing public humanities work? And I, somebody told me about this guy, Neil Lester, who's, an, uh, who's a professor at Arizona State University. He's a really interesting guy. Prior to joining that institution, he was the first African-American to be tenured in the English department at the University of Alabama at Tuckaloosa, and that wasn't that long ago. Um, to Lester, performing what it means to be human felt more important, perhaps, than defining it. So instead of thinking about how am I going to write about this, I'm going to get out there. So he applied these principles when he founded Project Humanities an Arizona State initiative that par pairs students with local citizens for talk, service work, and something called Hacks for Humanities. And it's like a competition to create a tech product that can be 
used for the social good. So it's a really hands-on, collaborative, and concrete project, right? And it came, um, and it's interesting for me to think about this, that his engagement with the public humanities came when he was asked to think about the things that we talked about in the first transitional case. He was asked to think about which foreign language departments can we close at our university, and how can we bump up the number of English majors. So he was a dean, and he was asked to start. And so he began to think about the crisis in a bigger way. And to think about, he said it was necessary to not necessarily think about these sort of strategies for these smaller issues, but to think more globally, widely, about what the humanities mean for people on a day to day basis be beyond the number of English majors or the health of individual uh, departments. And he explains his thinking in the following terms, and I'm quoting, what does it mean to be human? I'm bogged down by that because I don't know what it means not to be human. What I do know is how I am human. And I can assess that and look at ways in which people have demonstrated or not demonstrated whether we are losing our humanity. So for me, the question needs to be more nuanced than a reeling off of a bunch of disciplines, which is what often happens. That's when we start excluding people from the conversation. Humanists, he continues, were restricted on our thinking about what humanities could be and what humanities are. How do we connect to the wider world? How do we face the public? And so he gives an example of this project that he did at the University of Alabama. And he, had a, he would travel around to um, senior homes, community centers with this talk on Zora Neale Hurston. And he said that, I took their eyes were watching God and looked at the talking rituals and put them in historical context of the folks who were denied voice, whether it was through chattel slavery or Jim Crow or fighting for the civil rights movement. Orally, historically, these things have not been valued in the way that alphabet literacy has. I traveled all over Alabama. I always had a piece of literature or a text at the core. You see, he did it that way. But I would bring in Aretha Franklin songs, Etta James, Billie Holiday, and show that literature doesn't grow out of a vacuum." Unquote. So despite this kind of information and the objectively important contributions these projects make, there is popular buy-in to the, the, the notion that the humanities are irrelevant, elitist, deeply esoteric. Perhaps the organization that has most suffered from these char charges is the Modern Language Association. And Pat mentioned at the beginning, my, I've done a lot of work with the Modern Language Association. I really, really believe in the Modern Language Association. And the two of the last infographics I showed you were brought, were made by the Modern Language Association. Um, but it has suffered from a lot of these charges of, of being elitist and esoteric. But it is the biggest scholarly organization dedicated to, in the United States, for scholars of language and literature. And it actually has an international reach. Um, it has 25,000 members in 100 countries. We're primarily academic scholars, professors, graduate students who study or teach language and literature, including English, other modern languages, comparative literature. Um, the MLA meeting is once a year. We have a huge convention. There's usually 6,000 people there. Has long been known for outrageous titles and highly specialized topics of some panels. But many, if not most, of the charges of, are, of irrelevancy are misplaced, especially in recent times. And I think that the press tends to cherry pick some of the more sensational scholarly paper uh, the titles of some of these like weird scholarly papers that you know five people go and listen to. And they tend to focus on that in their reporting on the MLA and ignore some of the more down to earth and nuts and bolts things that we are doing. The MLA has in fact been spending more and more time on the issues of who teaches and what goes on in the classroom, curricula in reform, working conditions for adjuncts, right? They've investigated and produced important guidelines on issues such as freedom of speech, women and minorities in the profession, and it has focused more and more on engaging with the public and really attempting to make the case for the value and relevance of the humanities. Give a couple of examples of some of the initiatives the MLA is undertaking, and particularly how they are trying to show how humanities scholarship can be relevant. Um, at the convention, we do present papers. Yes, this is very kind of inside baseball. You know, you can get 
10 people really passionate about a topic. Um, and this is where it has been faulted for narrowness and in accessibility. But if we look at the presidential theme for this year, which shapes many of the scholarly papers, we can see that the issues raised resonate beyond the academy. This year's theme is persistence. Judith Butler, professor of rhetoric at UC Berkeley, frames this theme in the following way, and I quote, the humanities are now compelled to fight for its own survival and to mark the path for persistence, despite during intensely challenging times of intensified precarity and tenuous grounds for hope. And then she makes the case for why the humanities can help understand this. Quote, humanities scholars are especially alert to the precarity of our profession, the universities, and the prospects for our students as we face contingency, attacks on academic freedom, anti-intellectualism, xenophobia, racism, social hatred, <clears throat> and the dominance of market values. As civil rights are suspended for individuals, blocked at borders, and climate change threatens the earth, what part should literature and language scholars play in uncovering and creating these practices of persistence? Right? If academic work is to become responsive to the conditions that imperil life, what forms should it take? And then she says she wants to see people like send in papers on old, like on um, the racial imaginary, social movement literature, indigenous writing, prison writing, apartheid, systemic racism, colonial powers, border migration studies, disability studies. I think we can all find here topics and themes that seem relevant and urgent to our lives and those of our fellow citizens. Each convention offers sessions that are free and open to the public. They hope to engage with a broader audience beyond professors of language and literature. One new initiative aims to really, really, and this is hard for us, oblige professors and researchers to think about the wider ramifications and wider implications of our work. It's called Humanities in Five. And scholars are challenged, and it's a competition. Scholars are challenged to speak in five minutes in le or less about a research project, often their book, and to do so in a way that make, and they can't have any notes. Normally, as I'm doing now, a lot of humanities professors tend to read. You know, we feel very comfortable with our, with our texts, uh, very comfortable. And so they're trying to get people to get out of that comfort zone. Five minutes to sum up your fabulous, super intellectual argument, right? Um, and clips are available on YouTube, and I was going to show some, but then I was like, then I looked at them, and I was like, it's, this is in its infancy. We just started this, so maybe it needs to be a bit more polished before um, I submit it to some of you. Um, I watched one, and the MC went on a very long and rambling preamble about why this was important, and I thought, well, you're kind of missing the point here. And then he gave uh, this really long, and like, and this is the first person is the author of 10 books. And I thought, the people who are listening to this don't care. You, the introduction is longer than the talk, right? But, um, but we spent an enormous amount of time and care in the program committee, of which I'm a member at the moment, thinking about which topics are going to be interesting to the general public. And can this particular person, do we know if this person can really do this. And as I said, it is a work in progress, but I think it's really an important addition to the program to get beyond the kind of three people sat in a row reading their papers like this and answering very kind of sort of esoteric, like this is a word that is so perfect, but questions. This is much more outward facing, and maybe we need to start training our graduate students to think about their research in these terms, right? How can we distill our scholarship? and pull out the socially relevant piece of it. And it's always there. I refuse to believe that it's not there. But how do we communicate that without feeling that we're somehow betraying our intellectual principles? So those are my two case studies. And I hope that I'm left you with the idea that there is a transition that we need to take. We need to reach out to the public. We need to partner with the public. And also, we need to think, what do our students want? We need to not feel that we're selling out by listening to what they say. And I think these are hopeful. They, they speak to hope. Now, this last thing I'm going to talk about is not very hopeful. But this is where you all can come in and can partner with me by, I'll tell you what you have to do at the end. OK. 
I would like to draw your attention now to something that is really a crisis facing one of the biggest generators of the public humanities, the National Endowment for the Humanities. One of the most important things, as I have said, in hanging on to our precarious existence is to make our work more understandable to the general public. This is a difficult time to make such a case when the latest budget being proposed by the White House involves, once again, shutting down the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the National Endowment for the Arts. While we can stress the importance of the public humanities, draw attention to the centers and individuals within our universities that promote such in initiatives, the fact that the government wishes to start participating in humanities funding has dire consequences on both a concrete and symbolic level. For those who might not be aware, early on Monday, the White House last Monday released its annual budget for the next fiscal year, charting a path for the administration's potential second term. The $4.8 trillion dollar proposal included seat cuts to social welfare, foreign aid, and housing. But for our purpose today, significant is the fact that federal humanities and arts programs are on the chopping block. This year marks the fourth time that the president has threatened to significantly cut both organizations' budget, and this time the budget proposes abolishing the agencies altogether. The heading under which the agency's closure appears in the budget document is entitled, quote, eliminating programs with no proper federal role. There is no proper federal role for the humanities. Therein, it is stated that activities funded by NEA and NEH are not considered core federal responsibilities. It appears that the White House has requested that Congress appropriate $33.4 million to the NEH for the orderly closure of the agency. While we know that the current president is not necessarily interested in the humanities, he is unlikely to put out a reading list every year as President Obama does. And while perhaps this literary and human humanistic passion might not be something that we deem as a necessary requirement for the US president, I do think that all those on different sides of the political spectrum could agree that the existence of government, par government participation in the humanities and arts is a good <laughs> and necessary aspect of a healthy society. And they function as invaluable resources for harmonious, prosperous, and democratic principles. 1965 was when scholars and congressional leaders wrote the founding charter of the NEA and NEH, and they were explicit on those critical points. And I quote, the NEH and the NEA um, have a high place accorded by the American people, the nation's rich cultural heritage, and to the fostering of mutual respect for the diverse beliefs and values of persons and groups, end quote. It proclaimed that a democracy such as ours needs to honor and preserve its multicultural artistic heritage, support new ideas, provide financial assistance to the nation's artists and the organizations that support their work. These founders also saw the importance of the arts and humanities as safeguards against disruption associated with rapid technological transformation. And I quote again, democracy demands wisdom and vision in its citizens. It must therefore foster and support a form of education and access to the arts and humanities designed to make people of all backgrounds and wherever located masters of their technology and not its unthinking servants, end quote. Seems very prescient today as we talk about automation, the rapid development of artificial intelligence and our generalized dependence on technology. It's not bad, but we need to be technology's masters, not its servants and the humanities and arts, it was believed could help forestall that. So we have the NEA and, NEH, and the NEH rather, distributing more than 10 billion in direct grants to organizations as well as individuals in all states and ter territories. Half of this funding has been leveraged with private funds that would never have been part of the, of the equation had it not been for the federal government's um, initial uh, grant, right? Colleges, museums, historical societies, arts organizations, libraries, archives, cultural, small and big, anchors for their communities from Newark to New Orleans. All American citizens benefit from the program supported by the endowments, parents and children, teachers and students, artists and veterans. Mentioning just a few of these existing programs demonstrates this. And a look at the NEH's website details some truly meaningful cultural projects that if no longer funded, threatened to impoverish the cultural landscape for a wide range of us. 
NEH initiatives such as a more perfect union are supporting national conven convenings on K-12 civics education. Um, we've got grants that are working with, um, NEH has an amazing grant that works with NIH, um, National Institute of Health, on, um, I think it's NIH, but one of the science, science-y ones, um, on <laughs> preserving Native American languages and looking at ways to preserve these languages. We've got um, pay, uh, projects that are uh, digitizing and preserving the papers of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, other presidents, writers, thinkers, Willa Cather, Ernest Hemingway, Martin Luther King Jr., Thomas Edison. Um, we have recently in St. Louis received a grant from the NEH to expand the Holocaust Museum and Learning Center of St. Louis. Uh, Philadelphia's Historic Christ Church received a grant. The George O'Keefe Museum in Santa Fe received a grant. Um, co community colleges have received grants to learn how to take their message globally. I just find it hard to believe that these things don't touch so many different people. Um, grants, programs like the NEH Dialogues on the Experience of War enlist the humanities in helping military veterans and their families come together to discuss these difficult issues raised by war and military service. Um, I've got tons of examples here, but I think I'm running out of time. So I'm going to skip, but I'm going to urge all of you to please go to the NEH website, read about the projects that touch so many aspects of all our lives. If the NEH is closed, we will be all so much the poorer. In a period of uncertainty and mounting challenges for the humanity, as well as the great yet also dangerous potential for harnessing technology and big data, the founding mission of the NEH remains as important as it was in 1965. It plays a fundamental and apolitical role in serving as an impartial national assessor, catalyst, and guarantor of the vibrancy of the arts and the humanities, and as equitable distributor of support for programs that nurture, inspire, and employ millions of people across every district in our country. So please go to the website and maybe send an email. I don't know. Make a phone call. But I want to end with one, type, one tiny thing that I'd like to say as a kind of uplift for this, not to end on such a very depressing note. We go back to Professor Neil Lester, who I think is one of the best practitioners of uh, public humanities. He too, he too thinks we need to think about the impact of the humanities and what it teaches us about being human in different ways. As he says, if, you're t if somebody's switching from an English major to a poli-sci major or a bio major, you still have the student there. The student isn't leaving the university. So I'm suggesting we reframe this notion of just measuring, this is him, not me, measuring our progress based on numbers, he says. It's not just people having these armchair conversations. We need to be out there. We need to be performing our humanity. We have been doing a homeless outreach program, he says, for five years. We distribute clothing, sh shoes, and toilet toiletries. And I can tell you, we don't have any specific majors down there. And it's intergenerational. High school students, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, ret 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 retirees. There's such gratitude, and we can call that Humanity 101 in action. Thank you. Are there questions for Professor Kirk? Um, I've been getting messages for, about NPR. Uh, is that a casualty of this yes. legislation? Yes. Yeah, okay. I think we can all assume right. that this is right. not something that that's that, one of the yeah. I mean, benefactors. I don't think there's no there's any um, plan to shut down NPR, from what I can understand. Um, I don't think the budget goes as far as that. I mean, and, and the likelihood that this budget, as is, will pass, given the Congress, is probably highly unlikely. But I think that the fact that we are having a national conversation about closing. National Endowment for the Humanities, closing the National Endowment for the Arts, defunding and restricting NPR is really, really frightening and really uh, damaging. So yeah, you know, I think all these things are part of a, of a, of a package of um, removing culture and debate from our society.
I can hear you, but I'm not sure if everybody else at the back can. There are two statements that come to mind. Uh, one of them you still hear, and it's important, and the other one I don't think you'll hear anymore. The first statement was, people who do not know their history are doomed to relive it. Right. And the other one was a statement I heard years ago. To understand politics, you've got to remember the Peloponnesian War. <laughs> I and, love it. Uh, Western Civ is, is vanishing from the... It is, but I think it's... I, I mean, we have... I mean, the classics department in, in Washington University has been retooled. It's been given a PhD program that it didn't have before. Classics... I mean, I think classics looks very different. This this, this um, in 2000 and where are we? 2020 looks very different in 2020 than maybe it did. And maybe Western Civ had to change. I think Western Civ probably did have to change to become more inclusive. Um, I think that those kinds of classes have immense value. And we should still teach the Peloponnese War, but we should teach it alongside other things. We should teach it alongside traditions in Africa. We should teach it alongside, you know, indigenous traditions and empires in, uh, in um in Latin America, um, there's a very famous independent fighter for uh, Cuban independence called Jose Marti. And he wrote this amazing um, uh, essay called Our America. He was a really interesting guy. He died fighting for Cuban independence. He was a journalist in New York, fascinating, a poet. But one of the things he said was that in order for the American, I think Latin American university, to really serve its people, it had to teach them about its own history. And so he said, we can't keep teaching about ancient Greece. We need to teach about the Incas. So I think we need to bring in different uh, stories alongside the ones that have always been taught in Western Civ. I don't think Western Civ, the texts that were taught in Western Civ should disappear, but I think they should be taught as a broader array of traditions. I don't think that one culture necessarily should be given preeminence. I think our students need to learn about all cultures. And what was the type of Peloponnese War that was happening in Africa? What was the Peloponnese version of the Peloponnese War that was happening in you know, ancient America? So that's my feeling on that. And it's possibly not the most popular opinion, but I think it's the one that our students perhaps feel more interested in. But I think I love your idea of the importance of history. I think it's, if only. I mean, the history major is plummeting. It's, it's terrible. I'm wondering if um, maybe your audience really needs to be the larger university in the sense that, I mean, I have multiple children and daughter-in-laws, et cetera, who were at Washington University I was impressed with the institution. They liked, they had a great time here. They did great. But I'm a little disappointed in how much they could focus on what their major was and how little they learned about other things. It's not an argument about the Western canon no, or that at all. Yeah. I mean, it's an argument about, you know, if you're in the engineering department, you basically, I'm not sure you have to take an English class at no. all. Um, I don't. They didn't take a Shakespeare class. They didn't take a music appreciation class. Now, perhaps those can be recast for the mm -hmm. 21st century. But I think you're losing the argument, uh, n not in the overall society. I think you're losing your argument within your own institution. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, some universities uh, have really sort of taken, like, done a really amazing job in foregrounding humanities. Um, in making humanities part of their mission as we move forward. I don't think Washington University has done that. Um, we have become so STEM focused. We have become a pre-med institution to absolutely to the uh, detriment of other, creating more well-rounded students. Um, I taught a class a couple of years ago. I, as Pat mentioned, I have worked for a long time on the poetry and writings of this 17th century nun who is kind of Mexico's Shakespeare. And I find she's so, I'm so passionately interested in her. And I taught this class about her. That's all the class was about. And nine of my students were pre-meds. And they were like, we are just love being here. We can talk and discuss. We can read poetry. And it, I think it was like one of two classes like that that they'd been able to take. So you're right, you know, there, there are not that many opportunities 
Now, when you look at student satisfaction, student satisfaction in their STEM classes is very low, right? There's a, something called the Pulse Survey. Washington University is freaking out about this right now. I am a full professor, I can say this. But <laughs> because they're freaking out because Students are not happy with their STEM classes. They're miserable. They don't like the teaching. And there's some great teachers here, but there are also some people who, you know, could do a better job at thinking about connecting with their students, you know? And they, but they love their humanities classes. They love them. They have access to the professor. We can talk. I know who they are. I talk to them as human beings. I'm concerned for their welfare. And I'm not saying my STEM colleagues are not concerned for student welfare, but it's a very different environment. So we need a Washington University to do a better job in educating the whole student and making sure our students are not so STEM focused that they can't talk about Shakespeare, that they can't talk about the Harlem Renaissance, that they can't talk about things that will give them other skills. And, as, and my husband, who's in the audience today, is always saying that you know doctors need to learn how to talk to people. They need to learn how to communicate with their patients. And maybe humanities will give us that. I don't know. I mean, but yes, I get your point completely. And I don't think university is doing a best, its best job at that. I'll work my way over to the other side. Thank you for your presentation Thank today. You. Um, I would like to at least uh, mention that here at Washington University, at least some of the ground uh, east of Brookings, they built a whole new building relative to engineering, but they did add on to the museum, the art museum down there. So that's a that's a uh, yeah. step in the right direction. I I would uh, offer that um, a, a topic that gets little mention, and I'm grateful that you mentioned it today. That is a culture and society wrapped around artificial intelligence, and that's only going to get worse it seems to me, before it gets so better. Scary. As a, a former elementary school principal, um, I was always amazed that media literacy got little to no attention. Um, that seems to me to be a 21st century course that's uh, imperative, mm -hmm. to separate truth from right. half-truth to oh no God. truth. Yes. How to do that yes. in an information-rich society could well <laughs> mean the society or the uh, survival of humankind. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, my son is 12, and he spends a lot of time on his screen, and he watches YouTube incessantly. Where, and I was trying to explain to him like the difference between YouTube journalism and print journalism or radio. That there is a code of ethics and truth that governs, that, but there is none in the kind of stuff that he's watching. And he's not. He's 12, but we are constantly trying to point him to kind of be more questioning and to have a kind of level of skepticism about some of the things that he's like. So yes, media literacy needs to be taught. And our, this is the problem. We need to kind of get with the program. What are the things that are affecting our kids' lives? You know, yes, we, I, I spend hours saying, get off the screen, get off the screen. But at the same time, I need to understand what is going on with him and how to give him the tools to have a responsible relationship with technology. And I think that, and, and the AI stuff is so scary. It's so frightening. So I think when you read, when I read that about the, the 1965 charter and what they said about technology, I was like, this is it. This is what we can do as humanists or people interested in the humanities. We are the bulwark. We are the only thing that's stopping this. And I hate to sound so alarmist, but I do think that's what it is. I was wondering to what degree are there collaborations going on between departments like humanities, sciences, yeah. arts. Um, our daughter went to University of Michigan and there's a program there called, as part of the arts and sciences, the residential college, right. where those yeah. programs work together yeah. and teach you know, arts and science together in classes. That's and neat. I wondered if there's anything going on here like that. Residential college is an awesome program, first of all, and I had a friend who taught that. But, um, and that was one of the things that we talked about when I was um, on a different committee at the Modern Language Association. How can we partner with sciences? Sciences can be support for us. You know, they can be our allies. There really isn't anything of that nature. There's a, uh, one of the, my colleagues in Romance Languages, Rebecca Mesbarga, she has a program that she developed called Medical Humanities, which I think is wonderful. 
um, and she collaborates with uh, scientists and people mainly at the med school. She, her own area of um, scholarship is sort of uh, anatomy and 18th century kind of autopsies, and it's very cool, but she ha runs this program, so there is that, but it's a very small program. There really isn't anything, and it's very disappointing, but I just think it speaks to a larger lack of interest in the humanities at Washington University. Um, we'll see what happens. I mean, we have a new chancellor. We're about to get a new dean of arts and sciences. We have a new provost who is a biologist, but she came from Johns Hopkins where she raised an enormous amount of money for the humanities. So I'm hopeful that change is coming in the, in the best way, but change could also take the form of, you know, the modern language, you know, building with the department with, you know, Chinese and Portuguese in it. You know, it's, it's, I'm hoping the changes of that, the good kind, where we can find partnerships between humanities and science. Because it's not so necessarily compartmentalized in real life, so in everyday life. So I think that's an excellent way forward, but it's yet to happen here. Oh, there's a question over there, Pat, for afterwards. She's running. <laughs> I want to offer our son as one of your uh, case studies. We had a, a difficult time during high school, and we wanted to know, what do you want to do with your life? And he said that he would really like to be a history teacher, but he knew he couldn't make any money yet. That's the thing. And so it, it, just, it just dovetails with what you're talking about. Right. But after he went to a community college and got uh, an engineering uh, type uh, recognition, he went on to Mizzou where um, he majored in uh, electrical engineering. And of recent years, he explained to me that it was the most abstract thing he could do was electrical engineering. <laughs> so he, he, he was very fortunate in that all of these things that you're talking about, the humanities, they came to him naturally. That's great. And uh, an example of that is that every semester I'd ask at Mizzou, what did you take? What kind of a grade did you make? and there would be two Bs and two Cs. And the Cs were in electrical engineering <laughs> because his heart yeah. was in the humanities. Right. And That's so many of my students and are like it, that. And it still is. That's because, where his heart is. Well, at least he's able, perhaps, to enjoy those things. Maybe he's one of the few people in the United States who's reading a book. But yes. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Because, I mean, so many of my students are like that. I know so many of them would love to study humanities, but, you know, m mom and dad are paying or, or taking out massive loans. It's very hard to say, you know. But, again, the perception that you can't get a good job is a perception. But it's, perception is so much of what, how we live our lives. And the fear that you're spending tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars and you're not going to be able to get a job, or you're going to get a job, and you're going to be earning forty thousand dollars. I mean, how can you support yourself? You know. So, I, I mean, I understand that, but I just think we we need to keep pushing, at, like reframing, and changing perception. Thank you for a wonderful Thank presentation. You. I read where in the uh, 21st century. There's been a tremendous rise of the public attending art museums, history museums, and science museums. Museums. Do you agree with that? Is that accurate? And if so, what? How do you? Uh, what is the? Is it meaningful? Huh. It, does it give us encouragement? Or? I haven't heard that statistic. I have. I read something recently that talked about how important it is for your brain to go to museums and what looking at art or like science kind of like installations can do for your brain. Um, I think that I can't, I, I'm thrilled to hear that attendance is up. I think perhaps it has to do with, you know, people like us who are interested in these things pushing back a little bit against some of the kind of 
um, annihilation of cultural institutions um, and supporting. I hope that's what it is. I mean, I know from my own, I feel much more passionate about going to the local museum, going to Slam, which I love anyway, um, and taking my kid and sort of tr introducing him to all these things. So I, perhaps that's what's going on. What worries me is that NEH funding is so, and NEA funding is a huge amount of that. You know, they support exhibitions. They support, you know, and again, they and they uh, they bring along matching private donations. So, um, but I do think that that's what we need to do: is support our cultural institutions, do what we can to like put ourselves in the room. You know, um, maybe that's a small act of resistance. I never really thought about it like that, but now that we're talking about it, I feel like maybe that could be a way to resist some of this: is to take our bodies and maybe a few of our dollars into these cultural institutions. And we have some pretty amazing ones right in this city. So, and it is apparently really good for your brain. <laughs> we'll take the added benefit. Could you do something to get your undergraduate majors and your grad students to go into local schools and teach and interact? You might get some young teachers that way. Right, be. well we do have, so we have an education department and they do go into elementary schools. We also have um, students volunteers. I was picking my son up at Y down and bumped into one of my students who tutors there and it was really thrilling to see her. But I do not build and we have some science programs, but I do not believe that we as a university have done enough to reach out to the community. Um, and I'm hoping and maybe this will be part of I have heard our new chancellor say on more than one occasion that he is really interested in engaging with the city of St. Louis. He believes that the institution and the county, that he believes that the institution Washington University needs to be part of St. Louis, not just randomly happen to be here. So let's see if he puts his money where his mouth is. It's all up in the air. We do not know what's going to happen. We're in the middle of beginning, in the middle of the process to begin a strategic plan. But there are small things like that that can be done, you know, that don't necessarily need a massive, huge, million dollar investment. Um, I, yeah, I mean, we do have some small programs, but they need to be bigger and they need to be more systemic. I, I was just going to add that the um, new chancellor, the woman who talked about the residential college at Michigan, yeah. the new chancellor was the dean of arts and sciences remember, at yeah. Michigan. Yeah. And so he certainly is familiar yeah. with the residential yeah. college. Yeah, I mean, I, it would be nice to think that we could have a program like that here, um, that he learned something from his time and bring some of his ideas from, Mich from the ideas from Michigan. He didn't start it, obviously, but he was there while it was ongoing and flourishing. It's a big, interesting time for Washington University. But I haven't heard, I mean, the new provost gives me a bit of hope. I've heard a lot of really good things about her and her relationship to the humanities, some of the centers she founded at Johns Hopkins. Um, but I have yet to see anything that makes me feel very optimistic about the future of the humanities here. But, you know, hopefully I'll be proven wrong. Two, two parts. First, uh, oh, sorry, I was like, where is this coming from? I'm bad. <laughs> um, uh, the, I, I think the public appetite for history is being uh, uh, fed, too, by these programs like Finding Your Roots. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, these are commercially done, but they're um, interesting and intriguing people Definitely. about those histories and their yeah, wonderful sure. stories. Um, but anecdotally, a friend of ours who graduated with honors from law school here uh, is a professor in a law school in another university and is teaching uh, legal writing cool. mm -hmm. and has been uh, uh, the subject of a verbal assaults and, and rage from people who had these ideas about this glorious law career that uh, was being thwarted because the students cannot write right, yeah. uh, a, a careful document right. um, and that this is serious and, uh, and failing that course is like the washout course in the freshman series. Well, people are not able to write, learning to write in K through 12. I'm concerned about our, well, and it's the technology with our 
continuing uh, um, encrypting everything and <laughs> loss of uh, loss of punctuation. Yeah. Um, the Oxford comma. <laughs> yes, yes. So. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I feel that, my, I don't know whether it's a function of uh, technology or a function of uh, programs like No Child Left Behind and the fact that we teach exclusively to the test in K through 12. But my students that I have 2020 are not as equipped with writing skills as they were in 2003, 2004. And I've seen that, you know, go down and, it's, and they don't, they're not able to read as much. Um, I've had to adapt a lot. I mean, it's not their fault, and they're really smart, but they don't have these core skills the way that they had um, 10, 15 years ago. And I definitely think it's a, it's a combination of factors. So I'm wondering, in your tenure, if any languages have been dropped, are there any languages that used to be taught here that aren't, and, are, and the obverse, yeah. are there any languages taught now that weren't taught when you started. Russian. Uh, the it Russian department dropped. was closed. Um, I think we still have a couple of faculty members teaching Russian. I mean, it seems like that would be kind of a big thing. But, <laughs> but that department was closed when I first got here. Um, Portuguese, which, you know, we had, we've had a Portuguese off and on. They will not allow us to create a Portuguese minor, which is Brazil is a behemoth. I mean, it is a cultural, social, economic behemoth, and no, we, you know, we will not. We can. We have one uh, lecturer who teaches Portuguese. Um, I think that uh, Asian languages have definitely um, soared in Arabic, uh, Mandarin. Um, they've really had a lot of uh, of um, money invested in them. Um, uh, French is really struggling. Um, I think French is struggling because, you know, it has, does not have that place in cultural kind of that capital that it had once. But I also think that French, French Michigan is enough. If we go back to the example of Michigan, French at Michigan is doing really, really well because they have a lot of people working on francophone things, you know, West Africa, the Caribbean, whereas the French that we have at WashU tends to be much more kind of Proust and you know, things like that. So, and I think, again, there's room for both, but there needs to be a recognition of what French looks like today in the 21st century. Um, but I think that's a really interesting question. Um, our German department is actually flourishing because they're really clever about thinking about how do we speak to our students? What do our students want? What do they want German for? And they've done a fabulous job in really, they're very savvy. Because you wouldn't think that German would be flourishing. But it is. It really is. So, so I think some of it has to do with trends. Some of it has to do with decisions at the higher level by, made by people who don't understand anything about languages and the importance of languages. I mean, why would you close the Russian department? It just, it, it. But, um, uh, but you know, and then you know, a, a French department that is kind of still very wedded to some of the older ways of thinking about the discipline. So it's, we're in, it's a transition, Pat. It's a transition. <laughs> um, let's have one more round of applause for Professor Kirk. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Um, and so um, next week, Sophia Hayes from the chemistry department will be speaking on hacking climate change. So maybe that will be uplifting. Yes, and, and I would and, recommend uh, Sophia Hayes. She is amazing. And she recently did a TEDx talk. She's very cool. And I definitely recommend that. All right. Thank you. Hope to see you next week.